Okie dokie. Uh, all right, so I was making a lot of points about the deep spar and the configuration of the deep spar prior to plugging it into Windows. And so the only thing that I didn't really apply so that you could easily see it was, uh, was the HPA. So if I was on the drive and it, and it was up and I'm at the very end of a job, the last thing that I would have done after I made this image was I would have gone here and I would have said set maximum LBAs equal to the source. So it will read the source drive, then it will apply that, and it will then make my 320 gig drive a 100 gig drive. That's what happened. So when I did that, inside the system area, there is a table. And the table says, at power on, and it only does it at power on, if I try to set this again, you'll see I've already talked to the drive, but it hasn't reinitialized. So if I try to go and set this uh, twice, it'll say, error, I can't do this because I've already talked to the system area and wrote a number. And you haven't reinitialized me, so you have to power me off, and then the drive reads its initialization again at runtime, and then from then on it is that size. And so, so now, again, the thing that I would do, I'm going to switch back to a Windows machine, and I'm just going to show you that it works so that you can see what it would have looked like in real life. And then you will get to do all of these things yourself. Um, I'm going to power off my deep spar, take the 320 gig drive, plug it into Windows. And it will now be 100 gig drive. Now, in my life, as I'm working, there is this one little thing that happens every once in a while, which is a drive previously had an HPA set. A new tech comes to work for me and he makes an image of a drive and he forgets to reset the HPA. So the original drive that might have been imaged was a 40 gig drive. The new drive that was imaged was a 100 gig drive. And what would happen, I would walk up and I would see that there is a source drive with the destination drive. I'd look at the source drive and it would say 100 gigs. Then I'd look at this table and it would say 40 gigs and I know my tech made an error. Like I immediately know he made an error because what will happen is he will be able to process the data but he'll only get 40 gigs of the data. It will be knobbed off right here even though it has all this other data out here. There's nothing written in the data of the drive that causes the problem. It's in the HPA that chops it off at 40 gigs. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when I make an image of a source and destination I carry them around physically from then on till the end of the job. So I make an image, I have the source drive, I have the destination drive. I have now called the job done. I have done all the imaging I can do. Now I'm going to go do a logical recovery. So I'll take both drives off, I'll cross it so it'll look, it's just folded the other way. So I will literally take a drive and then sit it on top of the other drive just like this. So then these will then travel for the rest of eternity. This one has a label on it. When it comes into my office, I make sure that before they ever get to a tech, we have a front office, Allison in my office, who you've all talked to, she labels every single thing that comes in that room. Nothing goes to a tech until it's labeled. So there'll be a number, a client name, they have a, a database, they keep track of those client names and that content and some notes, you know, I talked to them, I shipped it, here's the UPS tracking number, things like that. She always Xeroxes it. She has the paperwork that you sent that has credit card and uh, warranty stuff, and it's stapled together with a copy of the Xerox top of this label and the label itself for the client's name. So those two things go together. So we're documenting everything before it ever goes to a tech. A second copy of that paperwork, not including the credit card information, goes to the tech, goes with them. So he has a piece of paper and he can check off things, write notes on it, do whatever, and then come back and say, and then enter the data into the database and talk to the client. So he talks to the client at that point, Chase or I do. So, so everything's going together from now on. So the source drive goes with the destination. I own the destination drive. It doesn't belong to the client. They may have sent a destination drive to write the data to, but unless it's a forensics case, I'm not writing it to theirs first. I keep theirs in a rack and it's numbered 
and when the case is done and I'm ready to then give them their answer, I give them the resultant. Does that make sense? So I'm using my drives first. And then, then if there is a drive they've sent, I will give them the result. If there isn't one, that's when we send them an email. Here's a listing of all your files we've recovered. You approve it. Now you need to either provide us with a drive if you want to ship us one, or you can buy one from us for $89 or whatever it is. Okay? We will get one from you. We keep There's Office Max right next door to my office, so we just go get it. That's it. We don't keep stock or anything anymore. We just we used to. We keep like three like at a time, but that's 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 one day. <laughs> like that's just one single day. So anyway, so that's the way things are going through my office. So while it's processing, I have a row of deep spars, I have a row of Windows machines, and some Linux machines and some other stuff that we don't only use if we have RAID arrays and stuff we have to do. So the Windows machines will do the logical recovery. So I'll do exactly what I did here. I plug in the drive, I go get our studio or whatever software is applicable, start it up, and I extract the data. I do not use Explorer. Windows Explorer, the running software, I do not just open up the drive and copy the files off. I'll explain why tomorrow. We'll get all into those things. There is no, there's a whole bunch of things that are wrong with that idea. And I know a bunch of people do it, but... Uh, that is not the correct way to do anything. So the two drives are married together. If I see a partition structure, especially at the beginning when I first hire a guy, it's always the thing I have to check on. Make sure he reset the HPA. If he did not reset the HPA, we do not have all the data, and we have an HPA, there's nothing really wrong, he just set it wrong. He just didn't set it. Does that make sense? It's very important to know those things. It only happens when you're doing multiple recoveries. It is not something you're going to see in this class unless you have done it yourself on purpose because it would be really rare for you to have overlap with other people and have multiple settings. Does that make sense? But you would only get half of a recovery. You wouldn't get the real recovery. You wouldn't get the right thing. So you have to start forcing yourselves to do certain settings. There are some things you can set up in the deep spark to do that automatically. I still say I do it manually so I confirm it at the end before I'm done and I take it away. Okay? So that's the spiel on the HPA. We will use the HPA. I'll always set it at the end to kind of restrict myself to what it is that we're working on. And that's, and that's it from that standpoint. So now you at least know the tools and the process we're going to do. Okay? So now we're going to switch to, I'm going to just say a couple words and finish up these slides super fast because here's the thing. I wrote the rest of this stuff, I wrote a really long part just to say, hey, if you take parts out of your hard drive, it's going to be 10 times worse. B, do not ever use a USB to recover data with. USB is a terrible interface. I know you use it every day and we use it for a bunch of other things. For data recovery, this whole section is about USB, don't use USB, don't let it make any changes to your drive. You know that your drive is working because smart read something. This is all about smart reading the tables. So I've been redundant. I've already said these things a few times. There's some stuff in there. If you want to use smart for testing, I list G-Smart Control. I list all the tools you can do. But fundamentally, these are the things like the bull crap that everybody always thinks is the beginning of doing something. Do not use USB to recover stuff. Plugging USB into your Windows machine to try to recover a drive, if there's errors on that drive, you will not get past those errors. You, there are tools that use USB to do that, and they are specific data recovery tools. The Atola has a USB interface. It's the second best, it's not the best. The best is the Deep Spars, without a doubt. They have a board they sell, it's $1,800. It has a USB interface on it. For many years, if you did not have a, if you had USB, you could just unplug and rip that board off and make a change, solder on some wires, and you could make it a SATA drive. The SATA controller was still on there. There are some recent hard drives. There is no SATA controller on the board. So you only have two options. Either get the equivalent drive that has a SATA connector, which is what we used to do with IDE. When you had an IDE drive or SATA drive, you could switch the boards and you could switch interfaces, as long as you had the ROM. Um, you can kind of half do that with USB drives, but uh, as a whole, uh, it's easier if you're doing it through the USB interface. It really depends on encryption. You, uh, encryption is the big deal. 
Do not use USB plugged into a Windows machine and expect that a data recovery and software and imaging is going to work. That's not going to work. You have to break that interface, get a SATA interface, or use a USB specific data recovery tool. If you can read from the smart area, then you know you have something that's working. Even if it's on a USB device, there are tools that can read smart. So that was my entire point of all of these slides. Do not use USB. USB sucks. So that was it. And then there's these other things we've already talked about, PIO, UDMA, how to do stuff. I'm going to be more specific as we start going through things. And then old school guys that want to do a recovery on the cheap, this is an Adaptech old RAID controller called a 1200A. It's like 10 bucks on eBay or something. Uh, it has really good error control. So if you were trying to use a DOS tool to image something, which is still possible, or Linux as um, using DD Rescue, I could use this card with that, and the error control chip that's on this card is far better than what's built into your motherboard, and you could use DD Rescue and make that happen. So there are old school ways of doing things uh, that can be done cheap, free, less expensive. And so I started out in Hackerville, so from that standpoint, I would always choose those to begin with. Once I've learned them and I'm well enough off, I buy the next thing up. And I gradually get through till I can't afford whatever it is anymore, like Nuix for $26,000. Um, so things like that are just out of the range. All right, so that's my whole spiel for all these. Imaging in reverse, we talked about. It's the poor man's cash, turn it off. So this is why it works. And then these were the end of some of the other stuff. Now we've already crossed into day two. So we're technically, the deep spar is the beginning of the portion and there's a diagnostics portion. We're gonna do part of the diagnostics live. So on the day two material, I'm gonna skip ahead right now to rebuilding hard drives. So we can do real labs and you'll actually get to touch something instead of listening to Scott talk for day after day after day. So let me tell you where to go. Let us jump ahead to This is where I want to be. Which is three fifty two, page three fifty two, please. Okay, so. I'm going to start looking at the physical attributes of the drive and start trying to break it and then apply what I know about systems and hard drives and all the other stuff to it as we go. Okay, so first and foremost, uh, I'm going to kind of break them down into the removable components. So they, even though like the actuator arm has several components to it, they're on ribbon cables and you don't want to break them. So uh, when you're looking at a hard drive, you have four ways that a head parks. It either parks in this direction on a ramp or the other direction on a ramp. So it literally has a ramp to bring it off of the platter. And the idea was if you drop the drive, there's a chance that the platters will survive. The heads might not. The heads might actually hit each other and crash in this whole little container, but at least your data will be safe. And uh, you know some of the, some equipment, and there used to be like this uh, Toshiba commercial that was like, you know, the zombie apocalypse is coming, and if my laptop fell off the table, that uh, I would live. Really, all the whole thing is a little locking pen that's down here at the end, the little piece of plastic moves out of the way. And so that locks the head into a park position, so supposedly, if it was all together, I hope it's not going to hit too hard, and everything will survive, and not hit the platter. If it's more than three feet, it will destroy it, which is more than the table in most, like that's four feet. <laughs> so three feet is kind of the number. So, uh, so from that standpoint, the one things that we have to be uh, careful with uh, is which way the platter turns. So if the head is mounted this way, then the platter turns underneath the head. If the head is pointed this way, the platter turns this way. So the platter 
in some drives will spin the opposite direction. So you have a head going this way, a head going that way, or you have the other possibility which is heads parking on the inside of the platter. They park here and then on some drives they park here. So there's four directions. You have to pay attention to which direction that it is pointing. I think of it as a finger. If it's pointing that way, I'm spinning the drive that way. If it's pointing that way, I'm spinning the drive the other way. Understand? Do not ever spin the drive towards the head. You will have to spin your platter while you're moving your head over the platter. So your head will be sitting on the platter. And for the little movement that we're doing, it will not scratch the platter, it will not destroy it. It may make a terrible sound. It may go or something while you're moving it. That's fine. There is six layers before it, you have your head sitting on top of the platter. And there is a plastic layer, basically. What you would think of like a CD-ROMs plastic layer is on the top and then there is lubrication. So, there, so they do expect that it might touch the platter occasionally. So you don't have to worry. For the most part, you'll be fine if you haven't bent your head. If you have bent your head, it may be pointing towards the disc, and then when you turn the disc, you may cause a scrape. So you'll get good enough where you won't bend your head and you won't destroy it, okay? So you are going to have to manually, in many cases, turn this platter, and you're going to be moving the head to a certain location. Um, so I like to think of everything uh, try, I try to create a common denominator so we always use the same exact process no matter which one of the drives it is. So <clears throat> I always think of the heads pointed and into the center. So if it is parked here, what would I do to get this head off? I would move it to the edge. Now there may be some things I have to take apart, but I'd be moving it to the edge. I'd get it as close to the edge as possible. Then I would insert my duct tool basically, bring it down here, part the two heads, they would separate, then I'd bring it off of the platter. If the heads are parked on a ramp, I do the opposite. I spin the platter, I move the head to here. I stop. Then I back this ramp out, I get rid of this ramp. Hey Natalia, how you doing? I get rid of this ramp, and then I put the heads, I put my tool back in here and I part the heads and I pull it off. So I have the same process no matter which way the heads are, if they're mounted or not. I do not try to use the ramp to help me. There may be a time later on, or with some of the HDD tools that you can buy, you can do that. I do not want that to happen in this class. Right now, my whole thing is let's be the same over and over and over again, repetitive, till we get it down. So put the heads on the platter, and then you're going to insert your tool and remove them. You'll notice in this picture, there's wires running down the side. You may have multiple heads in a stack, and you may have multiple platters. If you do, I start at the bottom and work my way up. If I'm inserting my tools, they're going to go into the bottom area, and then I'm going to do the bottom pair of heads, and then work my way back up to the top stack, okay? It's easier to work from the bottom up. If you put them on the top, you can't see what you're doing, it's harder to work down, okay? Always start at the top, at the bottom, and work your way up to the top. Also keep in mind, the number of wires is important. You may have two platters, but one head may only exist on the bottom. So you may have one head on one side or one head on the other side. You don't know right away. You have to look for the wires and see if you can determine, do I have one head down there or two heads down there? And then we'll make a Z-shaped tool instead of the duckbill tool like I described yesterday. I'll show you those, we'll get to that. Everybody good? But we're gonna have to help the head come out. All right? So, and then if it's parked the other way, I do exactly the same thing. I move the head to the outside edge, I get close and then put my tool in and then I help it get out. Okay, so that's our goal, is to try to get that far. So I'm gonna break this thing down. We're gonna be breaking out all the parts like this. So we're gonna be separate, separating them. The actuator arm itself, this is what it'll look like when you get it free. Um, so the, there's a joint, the actuator joint would be sitting right here. And usually there's a couple of holes actually right here. I do not want to grab by the wire. I want to grab by the holes. So if there's another hole or something here that can help me take the head assembly out, I have tweezers and I have needle nose pliers in your bag. So your black bag has a lot of tools in them. We're going to try to, and I would grab them right here, I would be squeezing between these two locations, not squeezing from here to here. I do not want to squeeze to the outside because what's over here? 
the platter. I don't want to stab the platter. I don't want to ruin the platter. So you need to be able to remove this head assembly without doing those things. Okay? Good? All right. So uh, you don't want to bend it. You don't want to cause any damage to it in the process. Your whole job is to keep them parted like this. That's your goal, is to part them in whatever way you have to. Okay? Uh, if they hit or they collide, they can do damage or they can stick to each other. And then you can't get them apart sometimes, so you're doing damage. It doesn't mean if they did touch that they did do damage. If they did touch, pretend it didn't happen and keep on going through the entire process, even with the damaged parts. The whole point you're doing today is learn muscle memory. So even if you just destroy something, just keep on going, pretend it didn't happen so you can make it through the rest of it. Because if you find something that you didn't know, like, oh, if I didn't remove this screw over here, this wouldn't come out right. After you've already destroyed the heads, you might not know that part till you got further along. So my whole thing is to keep going so that you learn the drive and what your mistakes might be because it costs you money in the end. Every time you destroy a donor drive, you lose money in this process. So you need to learn everything about the drive with one practice drive, and then you can do a real drive, and then keep on going. Every drive will eventually look the same to you. You'll have the same process. So you'll get a stack like this. My very first thing that I do is I look at it and I go, okay, it's pointing this way, platter spins this way. Second thing is, it's got a ramp, so I'm gonna be putting all these heads up on the platter, removing this ramp. If you try to use this ramp to help you, even though it looks like all the heads are already separated and they're off, it will bend your heads, I promise you. So there may be other tools out there. HDD Surgery's made some tools to help you in that process. When you get that far and you spend the money and you saved all your money, you'll save a lot of time. It'll solve you a lot of problems. But I still do all these by hand. I'm still going to do them all by hand. It makes you a better person. Be a better person. Um, so I will park those onto the platter. I will remove the ramp. Then the next thing I'm looking at is this ribbon cable. This ribbon cable right here in my mind is weak. Uh, it's very easy to rip, tear, stab, put a hole in it, do something to that ribbon cable. Sometimes they even reinforce it by wrapping something around it because they know if anybody pulled on it, it would cause a problem. But a machine built this, so they don't care about you. Uh, so I would be removing the screws here. I'd get this out of the way, and I'd be very gentle over here. I don't want to rip this ribbon cable or it costs me a donor head, and it will cost me money. Next thing. I look down the row and I look at the wires. Now I can see all the heads because they're out here on a ramp, but when they're inside on the drive and they're parked in there, you don't know if there's heads in there. You don't know that that arm and what you saw, it ends right here. So if there's no head, they didn't waste any money. They didn't spend the nickel putting that on there. So that part down here might have two heads that are inside the drive, but you only see one, there's only one head on it, not two. So I have to look down the row and I look for the wires. Now this is a Hitachi drive, so this Hitachi drive has these little tiny wires that run down the side. Others actually will bind them to the edge of the metal, but Hitachis have a separate wire. It is really easy to pop. It is really easy to be inserting your tool, catch that wire, and pop it. So your whole goal is to get in between the two wires so that you're not catching the wire because your whole point is you've got one head going this way, one head going this way, and you're trying to keep them apart. Everybody understand? Okay. Uh, if you have a ramp and you tried to save your drive and use it using this ramp, what happens is these little nipples on the end bend and then they eat into your platter. And these little nipples right here become pretty important later on. I mean, you can see all the heads throughout this entire process, but it's captured right here when it's in park keeps it from moving around, flopping around, hopefully not hitting each other. But again, three feet's about the limit. We don't use paper anymore. We used to use paper back in the day, so this is a really old picture, and you can see all the fragments that it produces over everything. Um, and I could still do a drive like this, even with all these heads. It's not that big a deal to me. It may take a lot of time to align them, turn on and off a head, read each head individually, but eventually I'll get it done. Uh, but again, you're dealing with this ramp is really what you're dealing with as a whole. Uh, again, paying attention to the actuator joint where the ribbon cable's going. And you'll see, like I said, there's other holes. You can use other holes in the process to put a tool in and pick up your head assembly so you can keep it level when you're disassembling it. Um, on the drive, and the only thing I need, there used to be like this whole big discussion I had about how to repair a preamp, but there's no point. You're gonna replace the entire head assembly. A preamp is usually mounted right here. So I have this whole section about a preamp. There's no point 
and working on a preamp and doing anything, it's in there. Uh, if it's when you walk across carpet and you touch your drive and it goes bzz, and then it dies, what you killed was the preamp. That elect the shock of electricity, static electricity kills the preamp in the drive. So you're replacing your he entire head assembly. You're not resoldering the preamp on. People have tried it. There is a way to test it. There's no point. It's a lot of work for nothing. Um, this is one of the only ones that's an active lock. Most locks that lock the head assembly are not active. They're a piece of plastic and they teeter in and out because of airflow. And when you take apart your drive and you open it up, you're not gonna have the airflow you had while it was closed. You may sometimes have to move the piece of plastic out of the way or your head will not dismount. This particular one is made by IBM. You can see two wires coming out here. That uh, two wires are used for the lock mechanism because it's an electromagnet, again, just like the motor. And so this piece will slide in and out and lock and unlock. That's all that they did here was up and down, lock and unlock. So there are some that are electromagnets. It's pretty rare these days to see them. IBM's the one who spends all their time and money doing all these things. Nobody else really does much with those kind of things. So you may see those kind of mechanisms. You don't want to bend the head in any way. Keep in mind, it's got to stay perfectly flat perfectly aligned so you're only putting just enough tension on it to keep it apart. You don't want it to go and your heads be like this. They will bend and it will never work. It'll float over the platter but it'll be too far over the platter to read. The chances of you bending one back into place and getting it right is non-existent. Like it's not going to happen. Uh, I've tried hundreds and I don't think I can ever get one to work. Maybe I got lucky once, but it's pretty rare. You've destroyed the head, you got to go get another donor drive, do it again. So, uh, and this was all about the stuff we already talked about, the magnet, how it worked, cycles through the process, blah, blah, blah. Glass ceramic platters we've talked about in the coating. It's called thin film oxide. The silver coating that you see on the drive is thin film oxide. The orange drives that, like one of the pictures I showed you before, is uh, iron oxide. So it basically is rust. It's rust on the drive, so it rubs off and eventually it never works again. Uh, thin film uh, is very similar to um, the film they use to make movies. It's very similar to the same process as movie making industries use. It even develops the same way. If you put it in a developing material, it'll develop and you can actually see paths and servo information and things like that. I've seen somebody develop them before and it'll actually show you where content exists in certain ways, but you'll never be able to use that drive again. But that's, that's, what, that's what you can do with it. So this is a glass platter. There's two platters actually. These are the Death Star drives. This is the one when it dies, the head bent, it scraped the area, it ate it off, and it did it through all two platters. So all four sides are scratched. And so I'm just showing you there's a piece of paper underneath it. You can see all the way through pairs of platters. And so that used to be your data. And then somebody will always ask me, well, can you get this? Uh, no, your system area is gone and all your tables are gone and you'll never initialize a drive head and you'll never be able to get anything that can read that. It's destroyed. So we're screwed. See all this little dust and fragments? That's your data. Yeah. So you have to be really good at puzzles to put this back. Uh, it's gone. Glass platters, when you take them out and put them back in, if you do not align them correctly, when you start to push down on the screwdriver, you will crack your platter. That is also bad. You, if it's a client's drive, it's really bad. So you do need to be careful with these things. It will break, okay? And we don't need any stabby stabby. Uh, so anyway, uh, at this picture here, is if you bent your head and you left your drive running overnight, this is what it'll look like in the morning. Your head is actually skipping across the platter and it's slapping it with little squares. So you'll get checkerboard. This is just a fluorescent light so you can see the change in the colors. So you'll, these little white things are squares and it just slaps the platter over and over and over again as it's going through it. Now you don't notice it happening until the color starts to change. So as it gradually eats into the platter, it'll start doing physical damage to it. So you do not want to bend it in any way. If you bent the nipple on the end, I can tell what you did there too, because you'll get these little S marks all over the drive. Literally, you'll come back the next day and there'll be S, 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 and I like to call them snakes on a plane. 
but <laughs> I know it's a computer joke. It's terrible. I'm the only one who ever laughs at it. <laughs> so uh, snakes on a plane. Anyway, after you scratch your platters, now uh, this one's so bad. It's like a Xerox image of your head assembly and everything in the lid of the drive as you open it. It's like this is how bad it actually is. This is your data. So this is uh, this is what happens, and this sometimes is the only way you can tell if you've got a scratch inside your drive is that at the edge of the platter. Now, they already know that little fragments are coming off of your drive. It's a moving part, so it's like a motor or engine or anything else, and you have a piston that's moving all the time. It's going to have little shavings that are going to come off. So they made a track around the outside edge, and they collect them behind here. So there's like a little edge. The air will push that into and behind that filter. So people ask me all the time, does it matter which way I mount my hard drive in my system? And the answer is usually no if it's new or it's a brand new drive. The answer is yes, it matters after it's no longer a new drive, it's been there for a long time. There will be little tiny fragments and shavings back here in the back in this corner. And if you move your system, you pick your system up and you put it under your arm and you carry it out there and you put it back down someplace else, you knocked all those little shavings back into your drive and now they get stuck in a head and the head will scratch the platter. So one of the reasons that you don't want to move a system before you've backed it up because you can do physical damage. I see it happen to servers all the time. They've been running for six years in a corner, they move to another building and that drive is dead the second they turn it on. It wasn't dead before, it makes a cool... Uh, so, at least at this, at this point, you need to be really, really careful about that, but this air filter in the back, if the head was dead, started scratching the platter, when you pull this out, you'll see this beautiful black stuff on the back. Can you see it on this fil filter here? See how black it is? Now there is sometimes carbon on the inside, so sometimes it's difficult to see. Most of them are actually white. This would be solid white. This is supposed to be the, that color. It is silver because the data is all over it. So basically it has scratched all the material off and you no longer have an actual platter that has all the data on it. So you will not be able to read from that platter. You may be able to turn off the other heads and read from them. But if I'm looking at a drive and I want to know before I buy a donor drive what the condition is, I pull the air filter out and look at it. And if it's really bad, then it may be a waste of money. It might be something I need to look further at to see how much I spend. The worst one is a Western Digital Drive. I told you before, if you take out the top of the screw, the top screw on the top of the lid off the drive, that's the head alignment tool. That's the head alignment below it. So if you take that out, you have now created a problem that you might not have had. So on Western Digital Drives, there are these labels that have been put on the drive because the drive has been manufactured by a machine and aligned by a machine. So there is one here and there's a number one, another one right here. If you peel those labels off, you can tell most of the time if your platters are scratched prior to opening the drive itself. If it is scratched, you may as well open it and see if you can solve any problem. If it isn't, then it is possible, I have seen these things that look like head problems, but are actually a board problem. And if you can get a board and resolder your ROM, you can test it. So you can test another good board that works on a drive. On most test systems, when they test a drive, they read from three different locations. They read the beginning of the drive, the middle of the drive, the end of the drive. Those are checking to see if the board is working correctly because there are some things that happen on a board that sometimes a piece blows. The first half is a readable drive, the second half is not. It doesn't matter which half it is. That's why it checks three locations. So in some Western Digitals that is actually the problem, is that it's a board problem. And so I want to know that before I take the lid off. You will be taking the lid off, but I'm just saying it's a, it's a nightmare to get it realigned, but it works. So if I peel that back, it's clean. I have a pretty good chance my drive is fine. Uh, if I pull it back and it looks like this, that was supposed to be silver, that is uh, all the scrape data onto my sticker. And then this is what it actually looked like when I opened it up. Okay, so that I'm going to call an unrecoverable drive. Uh, whereas, you know, this one at least gives me hope and I might be able to do something about it. <clears throat> okay. 
All right, so again, we're going to be disassembling everything. I have pictures in all these different states of how I would be trying to remove something. I've tried many times to just move the heads out of the way and move the platters that are on a bad motor to someplace else. Uh, most of the time, again, mo this is a ball bearing motor. You can tell it's got screws and this will come out. This is ball bearings. Fluid dynamic ones are pressed into the case so they don't come out. <clears throat> you may have some of each. Who knows what we'll have in the surplus packs back there. So, uh, so in this particular instance, I may have just moved the platters over and not had to worry about realignment of a new head or something like that. But most of the time, you're moving the heads. So I would have been removing this and moving this over to another drive. So that ultimately is my goal. So those are the motors. I was trying to describe the parking area where the heads park. It's very fluid and it moves very well. But it's pro mostly because they edge it out into little tiny mountains. So the area where it parks, that part is not damaged. They scraped it on purpose so that it makes these little tiny mountains, then they fill it with lubrication. So you have mountains with lakes in between them. And so that keeps the head uh, lubricated and after it starts flying, then the head can go out over the platter. It's not touching the platter. It only touches it when it parks in the center. So, and that head points that way, so the platter goes this way. That's the way it spins. Everybody good? Okay. <clears throat> A bunch of pictures like that. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Uh, we'll get into that in the soldering. Watch. Anytime you open a drive and you see something like this, that means if you pull on it too much, that ribbon cable is going to come undone and you've added another problem to your list. And it's very difficult to deal with just that one. It's easier to get another donor drive. <clears throat> All right. So in our process, one of the primary things that we're doing um, now, I take off the electronics first. I flip the drive over and I initially take off the electronics. That's the first thing that I would do because those are easy to deal with. You get them out of the way and uh, when you put it in your bench, because you have a hole in the bottom that you can get to a head assembly if you need to, then you don't want your electronics to be there and be in your way after you've already disassembled the top of your drive. So then the next thing I do is I'm looking at the screws on the top of the drive. Now, almost every single drive's got the the six that go around the outside edges, then there'll be usually one right underneath or where the head assembly is. IBM drives have two more, so there'll be two more right here. And so I don't normally peel the labels back. I just take my sharp tweezers, I poke a hole next to it. You can feel where it's at, poke a hole next to it, and I draw a circle. And when you do that, it'll pop the screw just enough. That way the label's still intact, I haven't destroyed it. Now I would have a Xerox a picture of that label. I don't have anything in my office that doesn't have a Xerox or a picture of a label, period. There isn't any. Even the donor drives when they come in, I do it. So, uh, so there's there. And then occasionally you're going to have one here, right where the center of the spindle is. So there'll be a screw there. Now, I'm going to tell you this now, when you reassemble your drive, just for the sense of us working on the drive, don't put all the screws back in because you'll have to take them all back out again because you've got to realign your head assembly, you've got to play with it. So generally, if you're going to do anything, tack it down with the one screw that goes here, and then if you feel like it and it bothers you, you can put one here and one here. And then that way, at least we don't have to take out so many when we start working on it, okay? But that's all you really need to hold it together to make sure that it's uh, intact, but we're going to end up pulling the top off so we can work on the drives in the process, okay? So don't put all of them back. Keep them. And every screw on the hard drive is a different size. So you need to keep track of them and draw uh, on a piece of paper or some way to keep track of them and keep track of all your screws. I know a lot of your IT people have done this forever. So you want to keep track of all your screws because it will make a difference when you go to put them back in, which one goes in what place. This one screw is different than these six screws. They're not the same screw, okay? And then inside, there'll be different size screws and different length screws. Um, Inside the lid, when I've taken it off and I've flipped it over, this is the piece that's aligning a Western Digital. So this is a Western Digital. This right here, when I take this screw out, this is the screw that's going to cause me a problem. Because that screw being out is misaligning my head. It will not work. Even if I just took that out and put it back in, I might not be able to get that drive to work right away. I have to adjust it. And this is the one that's messing up people who put a drive on a uh, shelf and then don't come back to it for five years. Temperature changes and everything that's happened to it now that drives the clicker. It just clicks, clicks, clicks. And all you have to do is back the screw out and slowly start playing with it till it works again. So if you have that, there's a good chance that that's all you have to do is play with that screw, okay? 
The electronics come off most of the time with just four or five simple screws, an IBM drive, so these are just making contact with the motor with these pins. They just push down on it. If it's an IBM drive, the wire comes off and there's a little white ZIF socket right there. That little white ZIF socket has two little gray pins on the side. You push the pins and slide it off and the ribbon cable will come out. It's a very simple process. You just have to make sure all the contacts are lined up again correctly when you put it back on. And then you just unscrew the screws and pull this board off. Uh, and then on this board, this one happens to be what's called a dirty board. It has a lot of oxidation on it, which is why these are all kind of brown. That might be why the drive doesn't work. And so you want to clean these things a lot of times. We used to use a, an eraser back in the day, but now uh, you can use oxidation. There's like stuff you can add to the board and clean it. So you just want to make sure it's as clean as possible. And if I had to swap this with another board, this is the chip that I would be removing and swapping. So I, I would have another board that I would swap that chip with that's a working board that I know is working. I've tried it on a drive. And so we're going to get to the soldering part Thursday. Okay? Uh, but uh, this is the motor control chip. This is the smooth chip that sometimes gets fried. There's your processor and memory. So those are the primary things that you're dealing with. Um, this foam, get rid of it. Get it out of the way. You don't need it at the moment. If there's uh, anything that you don't have to put back immediately most of the time, it's the piece of foam here and the air filter on the other side of the drive when you were looking at it. The reason the air filter, you don't necessarily want to put it back in right away while you're working on the drive is that sometimes it gets sucked back into the drive. Uh, it's a little bit loose after you remove it, and from then on, it becomes a flying participle inside your drive, and so you want to be really careful with it hitting the head and doing some damage. So I don't put it in right away. This is where I was telling you there's another uh, sticker underneath the drive and you can look at the bottom platter and see if it's scratched. And if this, if it is scratched, if any part of the drive is scratched, even if the bottom platter is not scratched, there will be stuff stuck to the other side of this sticker. So you just peel it off and look at it. Okay, we're not going to talk about the, this is actually a picture of the stator, just so you can see what a real one looks like. So this right here is the cap stand it mounts on, then it would have a magnet, this would be powered, and then the drive would spin. And we're ignoring this for the moment. So, I've started it. I've had two versions that I've written. There's basically a picture version and then a written documentation version of how to disassemble a drive in the general specs of it. And so the first thing that I'm going to tell you right away is that you want to document everything. So if you've got a camera, take pictures of it when you open it so that you know what it looked like. I swear at the end, you'll be like, where did this screw go? Where did this adapter go? Like, you'll be wondering where things are from the inside of the drive. So take a picture of it and document it. Um, if you have two hard drives, you have a donor drive and an original drive you're working on, trust me when I tell you, if you don't label them, five minutes after you open and disassemble both drives, you won't remember which one. You'll doubt yourself all the time, where your pieces go, which one was the right one, which one am I recovering from. So you need to make sure that you document everything, write on it, do whatever you need to do to track where it is. I also always have a process I use. I always put my donor drive on my left hand and my original drive I'm working on on the right hand. That way I've built muscle memory to go a certain way and I don't even have to think about it. I can assemble it while I'm listening to music and I don't even remember doing it. Like I'd just be done and it just done. It's just working. Uh, all right, so those are the biggest things is organize all the stuff, write this down, draw pictures. The next thing is this. We need to make something we're going to recover. So those surplus drives back there are supposed to be all erased. I don't know if there's anything on them. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Um, you are going to plug it into the Windows machine in front of you. You are going to format the drive and I want it formatted in TFS. If it is a drive that's smaller than 32 gigs, it's going to ask you to format it FAT32. But I don't care what it says. You change it to NTFS. You format this drive as NTFS in the disk management tool that I showed you. You format it. Do not format the laptop hard drive. <laughs> right? One of you can make a mistake, but two of you can't. So that's it. There'll be like we'll be cloning our own drives all day to get it back up and running. So do not format the laptop hard drive. You wouldn't be the first. <clears throat> so uh, it has happened. Some of the stuff I even work on, I do in a VM 
only because someone erased the hard drive. Uh, <clears throat> so we are going to format it NTFS. We are going to write two gigs to that drive. I have a folder that's already created that has two gigs of data on it. And I'm going to tell you where it is. And then you are going to copy that to the hard drive after you get one to format. Now, I'm going to say this and I want to make sure it's clear. From here on out, you're going to have a multitude of drives, somewhere in the neighborhood of 8 to 11 drives you're going to work on. You always plug it in, format it, put data on it as NTFS every time you touch a drive. You will get so involved and eventually walk over, pick up a drive, and you will forget. And you will not format it and you will not put data on it. And that will be the one drive that will work. And what you will be recovering is zeros. And zeros are super unexciting. You can see the zeros go by, but you can never see any like it's that's it. You'll be like, oh dang, I forgot, but it's working. Oh great, oh dang, zero. Like it's all you're gonna get. Okay? So more than one of you will forget and not do this. It will happen. It happens every class, but then you won't make that mistake a second time. So make sure you put data on the drive. Everybody good? Always. I don't want to keep saying it every time, but I will repeat it occasionally, but someone will do that. So <clears throat> inside your black bag, there is a USB adapter that we are just going to use for formatting and putting data on the drive. That's it. That's all we're doing with that thing. You could later on experiment with taking a drive you repaired and rebuilt that was working on a deep spar. You could play with it on a Windows machine and see how stable it is. But remember, you cannot control Windows if it has a 600 millisecond time limit and your drive isn't doing well enough to make it past the 600 millisecond, it will die while you're copying files. So, but you can experiment with it, you can play with it, I don't care. Once you get good enough and you've done the deep spar and you've recovered stuff, good. Okay? Uh, so, I have a whole process with uh, this USB adapter. Now, here's the thing. The USB adapter, if you plug it into the laptop, and there is no hard drive plugged on to it, it will just show up as an ID adapter and it will never refresh. So, it doesn't matter how many times you plug that hard drive in, it's not going to refresh till you unplug it, plug it back in. The laptops also, the keyboard and the USB adapters are on a bus internally. So sometimes if you short it, it shorts the keyboard and like the whole thing doesn't respond. You have to turn the laptop off, turn it back on. So that's it. That's what, just what you got to deal with from the standpoint. Uh, you're dealing with XP. So sometimes the eject doesn't work and things like that. It's XP. Uh, that's the way it is. Um, it's not a big deal for this class. That'll be fine. Um, so anyway, I wrote all this down, how to use this, pop up your drive manager, right click and initialize. After you initialize, then click on the partition, create the partition, make it NTFS, do quick format. You do not need long format. Everybody understand what I mean by that? There is a checkbox that will say while I'm formatting NTFS, only do the quick format. And we'll be walking around helping you, making sure everybody's doing the right thing. But uh, most of you have formatted more hard drives than you are, than you care to say. But anyway, so you always have to, if it is not initialized, initialize it, click on there, right click, make a partition, NTFS, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> okay, good, 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 good. This is all the text version. Here's the graphical version. So from here on out, those will be the things that you'll do. So technically, the lab will start on 422. So page 422 from here on out if you want to review it while you're doing it. But you will be doing this live. We will be walking around walking you through things because I cannot tell you every single thing that has happened. The one thing I do need to show you is how to make your head combs. We're going to make our own head combs. Okay? Uh, so, step one, remove the electronics. Get those off. Step two, clear off all that junk. Step three, if it's mounted in your bench, I know these aren't mounted in the bench, but that would be where I'd want to be. Step three would be take off all of the label and everything so I can get inside the drive. Now, this is after it's formatted and you have data on it, okay? Not before, okay? Uh, if it is a IBM Hitachi drive, sometimes the metal, the labels are metal and you have to peel them off. So just know, if you can't make it through it with a tweezer, most of the ones you should be able to, but every once in a while, we got a metal one. <clears throat> now, when you open a drive, every drive, as soon as you open it, you should be examining that drive and thinking about how you're going to do this process. Eventually, it will become second nature to you and it will mean nothing. Just like driving a car, 
and pushing the gas pedal and the brake. So in my mind, I open this, immediately I go, okay, the platter spins this way, head's pointing this way, there is no ramp, I'm gonna move my head to here, what do I need to do to get that to move from here to here? There is a locking pin over here, and this would normally cause me to stop and I would not be able to move. There's another locking mechanism here. This piece has a magnet on it, and this piece is just stuck there, and eventually when the drive spins up, it'll just break free from the amount of force. But there is a gap. You can't quite see it here because the, uh, the, it's too dark, but there's an orange piece of plastic, there's a little arm that sticks out, and there's a gap right here. In theory, that gap is the only way that you can take off this head assembly. So basically, you break it free and it's right about here, and then that would move the tail just enough, it'd be in the gap. Then you can remove that piece. This piece is the piece that stops it from flinging off the edge of the platter. So once you remove this piece, if you don't watch what you're doing, and sometimes the drive has a mind of its own, it'll just move it to that edge of the platter and it will fly off the edge of the platter and destroy your heads. Okay. If that happens, pretend it didn't and keep on going and just keep doing the drive as if it had never happened, okay? The next thing I would be looking at is to say, well, <clears throat> I know I'm gonna take this magnet off and if I look at this magnet, there is actually a bottom magnet. There is two screws on the bottom magnet and there is one screw on the top. I don't wanna remove the bottom magnet screws because if I do and I drag the top magnet up, it's gonna drag the bottom into the head assembly and destroy it. So I leave the bottom screws on, I take the top screw off, then I take this off, okay? So you can do this in a couple different ways, but my first idea it would be this. Over here is the ribbon cable and the screws that are connected to it. I will not be able to move this head past here because this stuff will be in the way. So remove those screws, document them, put them in a row, put tape on them, label them, whatever you gotta do, and then pop this piece off because this piece has a dry gasket underneath and you have to push really hard to get it up. And then once you've gotten it up, then just move it out of the way gradually so that it's not covering that hole anymore so when your head finally gets there, it'll be clear. Then the next thing I would be looking at, and skip this for the moment, I'm just showing that's where I would be looking at. This will now be clear. And then the next thing I've gotta do is just break it free just enough, just enough for me to be able to pull this piece off. So I break it free and pull this piece off and then I will probably slide it right back to where it was right now so that I could remove this voice call magnet. Now you can do these in either order. You could take the magnet off first and then take this piece off, but you have to be careful about which way it's gonna cause head, the head to vibrate. You don't wanna hit the platter or do any damage to it. So it's up to you which one, but I would normally try to remove this first, then I would remove that, okay? and then I might need to make sure that this head doesn't move in the process because the head might move to the outside edge and then I've lost it. So I do use electrical tape sometimes. I stretch the electrical tape across here to here and all it will touch is the top of the head assembly. It is not touching the platter or anything else because that is submerged in the disc and this is higher than that. So it'll stretch across. Everybody understand what I'm saying? I'll show you a picture in a minute. So then again, I'm thinking about these screws. Leave those two, take this one, then I can pull this up with my tool. You can do this. You can hold your head. So when you don't have enough arms, you're not ambidextrous enough, you haven't had enough practice, use the tape to make that happen. There's a roll of electrical tape inside your bag. Okay? All right, next. Um, now, once you've looked at your heads and you know how many heads you have, you have to ascertain what is the head comb tool you need to create? Do I need a Z tool? Do I need two? Do I need a Z and a duck bill? Uh, what do I need? So once you know how many heads you have, then you can figure that out. If you ever have an odd number of heads, you're going to need a Z tool. If you only have evens, then you're going to only need as many as you have pairs of heads. So however many platters you have, you're gonna need at least one tool for every platter. Okay, good so far. I use trash. I use, I go to BJ's, Costco, wherever I can. I sometimes peek in the box and I figure out if it's made uh, with the packaging so that I can rip the packaging apart. Ginseng pills, Gas X pills, uh, Sudafed, which I discovered later on, don't mail Sudafed to anybody outside of the country. Uh, uh, <laughs> Customs doesn't like that. So I was young, I didn't know better. Anyway. 
So you want to use this packaging material to make your stuff. So what I'm doing, I throw away all these pills. I just basically get a big bag and throw them all away. I don't care about the pills. I just use the trash that's left over. Okay? So it's expensive trash because you're buying a box of ginseng pills that's 10 bucks and you just throw all the pills away. So the trash is worth more. Orbits I use for small drives. So if I'm doing a two and a half inch drive or a 1.8 inch drive or something that's small, I'm looking for thin material. So at that point in time, I'm looking for something that is thinner. So we usually have two sizes in your bag. There'll be some that are Gorbitz gum containers and some that are gonna be like ginseng containers or gas X pills or something like that. So the two and a half inch drives, I save the Orbitz container till I'm doing a two and a half inch drive. There occasionally is like a Hitachi drive that the heads are very, very close to the platter and you have to use a thinner material. So it does come up from time to time. One piece, even one box of this ginseng stuff would last me a lifetime. I could build every head I ever had and have a little bucket of them and I would have them for life. I'd have way more than I ever needed. Uh, you know, one sheet can produce eight or 10 of them once you know what you're doing and it seldom is a problem. Like I have them for forever. Um, so basically, I'm going to take material, I'm going to be cutting off the edges. I don't care about this aluminum and the aluminum and the trash on the side. What I care about is the plastic or whatever the supporting material is to make it bouncy. And then I put double face foam tape in between stuff. Now, in the early days, I used to cut off the back. I don't anymore because it gives me more bounce. So I typically make them like this. So like these are for two and a half inch, these are for three and a half inch. So this is going to be a stronger material. I've got double face foam tape in between and I can make my own size, whatever size I want them to be. So that's my goal is to do this. I started at the bottom and I started back here. I started back here. I grabbed it with my tweezers. I inserted it and there's going to be like a little weld right here. You kind of have to jiggle past. It's easier if your pieces are curved. And so you can kind of jiggle them past a little bit. The more square they are, the harder they are to get in place. So I usually curve the ends and make my own little kit out of them. And so I'll take a stack like this, pop it out, and I'll be cutting strips out of all the edges. And that's what I'm looking for is I'm looking to cut a strip, and then I'm going to fold it in half and put a piece of double face foam tape in there. I'm going to make one for you, and I'm going to show you the trick from that and that standpoint. But those are the ones I made. I started at the bottom, watch these wires, don't pop these wires. And the really cool thing about the way the heads are done, a lot of times there are holes and you can see under them. And so what I do is I make one side longer than the other side. And so when I'm putting it in there, I can see the platter. And so I can take one edge and lean it down, put the long side under the platter, and then push down, and then put the top side with the short one on the top. Does that make sense? So one's going under the platter and one's going above the platter. Yes, it's touching the platter. The plastic is touching the platter. It is not a fingerprint. It is not oil. It is not going to do damage to it. Um, the, the medium by which most things live, which I only know mainly because I deal with motorcycles, is that uh, whatever the metal is that you are using, you cannot clean or use anything that's stronger than that metal. So if you have chrome, you can use copper to clean chrome. Copper is a softer metal and it can clean chrome without doing any damage or scratching it. So when you have similar features to items, like you know, typically glass and glass doesn't cause any problem on it unless there's little fragments in between it. So in this case, what you have is a plastic coating on top of the disc basically the same thing as thin film and then you're using plastic which is not a stronger material I have never ever seen one of these scratch the platter what I have seen is you stab it with the tweezers and ruin the platter that's what I have seen or screwdrivers or whatever else or fingers or whatever but I have never ever had one that got destroyed by doing that okay all right so again no matter what size drive you're looking at, that's my goal is to build something that looks like this. So I want to get just close enough and I only want just enough material. I don't need this to be long. It does not need to be 10 feet long. It only needs to be long enough to get you just past the edge of the disc. And you have a piece of double-faced foam tape right here that's going to butt up against the platter edge. 
Now, like a CD-ROM, this little edge right there has got about a quarter inch of no data. The very edge of the platter does not have data on it. 